It's time for Drive-By Discernment with Paul Taylor and Todd Friel. Don't be deceived by the British accent. Welcome to Lecture 29 of Drive-By Discernment. Our buddy Paul Taylor from Great Britain was in town for the Psalm 119 conferences talking about theistic evolution. Sometimes when we hear Brits speak, we think that they're automatically smart because of that accent. Despite the accent, this guy is very very smart. God created the world in six days. That's what the Bible says. On day one, he made the earth, space, time, and light. Day two, he made the atmosphere. Day three, dry land and plants. Day four, the sun, moon, and stars. Day five, flying and sea creatures. Day six, land, animals, and man. That's the creation week. And that's what's laid out in Scripture. So if you want to add something to that, then you have got a problem because that's what's laid out in Scripture. If you believe then that there are millions of years of Earth's history, you have got to fit those into the Bible somewhere. If you want to believe that Genesis is true and believe in millions of years, you have got a problem. You've got to fit those millions of years somewhere. So you have some people who will put the millions of years before day one of creation. And then they'll have six literal days. Some people want to put the millions of years in a gap between the first verse of Genesis 1 and the second verse of Genesis 1. Other people will want somehow to spread the millions of years out among the six days of creation. What are all those particular positions doing? They are adding something to Scripture. And in Proverbs, we read that you must not add to the Word of God, lest He reprove you and you call you a liar. And that strong word is how we need to address this particular type of compromise on the book of Genesis. You see, the word that we use to describe this particular method of approaching Scripture that seems so popular with Genesis, but it sometimes gets used elsewhere, is called eisegesis. The correct approach to Scripture is exegesis, where we take Scripture and we submit ourselves to it and we expound what is there. We learn from what's there in Scripture. Eisegesis starts the other way around. We start with what we already believe, then we look at Scripture and we try to fit into Scripture what we already believe. And so it's very much like this sort of highlighter pen approach. We decide what we're going to believe and what we're not going to believe, and we try and find reasons for changing things. What are we talking about when we're talking about theistic evolution? We're talking about trying to harmonize the book of Genesis with the theory of evolution. Can the two be harmonized? Many people say, yes, they can. So maybe we should examine it and see whether we can harmonize it or not. We can't read all of these, but let's just see if there is any particular correspondence here between the theory of evolution and the biblical account of creation. According to evolution, the sun needed to, needed to be there before light came onto the earth, whereas uh, a biblical creation teaches that there was light first on day one and the sun was created on day four afterwards. That's the sort of thing we read. There's a whole huge number of lists here. For example, number 13, land mammals came before whales, according to the theory of evolution. You've got land animals that evolved so far, they decided to go back to the sea again, where they originally came from, according to the theory of evolution. I saw a marvelous cartoon in a newspaper, actually, and it was a picture of one of these fish trying to climb itself out of the sea onto dry land as it was evolving into a land animal. And there's a whale running the other way on four legs going down to the sea, saying, it's all yours, mate, you're welcome to it. According to the theory of evolution, there were dinosaurs before there were birds because they claim that dinosaurs turned into birds. But dinosaurs were land animals. And land animals were created on which day? Day six. Whereas birds, being flying creatures, were created on day five. So birds were before the dinosaurs. So even if you wanted to make uh, Genesis chapter one figurative, you will find that you cannot actually correspond Genesis to the theory of evolution. They do not fit. There are far too many, far too many differences between them. Well, say the evangelicals who want to try and harmonize the two together. That's because what we're doing is not looking at the real purpose of the book of Genesis. The real purpose of the book of Genesis wasn't to make a science textbook. After all, the Bible is not a science textbook, they tell us. You must have heard Ken Ham address this uh, many, many times. 
He said that someone in one of his meetings once stood up and said, the Bible's a science textbook. And he said, oh, yes, that's right, the Bible isn't a science textbook. I'm glad about that, because science textbooks change every year. And the Bible does not. But according to these people who hold to what's known as the framework hypothesis, the reason for the book of Genesis was basically to oppose the pagan ideology of the time that all these nasty Babylonians were going around saying that the earth had come by various different spirits here, there, and everywhere, uh, this pagan idea. And the book of Genesis was written to oppose that, which really misses the point. It's perfectly possible that when God inspired Moses to write the book of Genesis, that it may have been helpful in opposing paganism. But why would God oppose paganism by giving a polemic which is not in fact true? How does that actually oppose paganism if he is presenting an account which is not true? It doesn't actually make sense. You see, this is actually a logical fallacy. When people talk about Genesis being harmonized with evolution, it is actually a logical fallacy. Have you come across logical fallacies before? The idea that you make an argument which doesn't make sense. It sounds good on the surface, but it doesn't make sense. This is an example of a logical fallacy known as the affirmation of the consequent, that you assume something to be true, and then what actually happens, what you actually observe then, is used to prove what you said must be true. A good example of that in the theory of evolution, for example, would be that people say, well, you've got all these organisms that have got similar structures. We've got five things in our hands. Bats have got five joints in their wings. And many creatures have got five toes, unless they're on the Simpsons. And this is the sort of thing that we see all the time. Since they have the same number of digits, they must have had a common ancestor. That is affirmation of the consequence. They assume evolution, therefore they assume that what they see the similar structures is a proof of evolution but even if evolution were true which it isn't that would still be illogical because it's an affirmation of the consequence now I'm not going to try and say that that proves creation because that would also be affirming the consequence but what would we as creationists as people who believe the Bible expect to see we would expect to see similar structures because they're created by the same designer you see two cars in the car park of different models, but made by the same firm, you look at them, they may look similar. You don't say, well, one has evolved from the other, do you? Or that they evolved from a common ancestor. You say they're made by the same firm. And that's what we expect to see, which is indeed what we do see. You see how people like to twist things and how they like to get themselves confused, the sort of contortions they like to make. Milne and Bolin, in uh, presenting this idea of the framework hypothesis, said this. Biblically, we find the young earth approach of six consecutive 24-hour days and a catastrophic universal flood to make the most sense. Amen to that. However, we find the evidence from science for a great age for the universe and the earth to be nearly overwhelming. Therefore, we believe we must approach this question with humility and tolerance for those with different convictions. Because some scientists, and by the way, the evidence from science is not there, but because they say that there are scientists who say this and they interpret that as evidence, they then want to change their view of Scripture. They're not alone in that. Many conservative evangelical theologians in the past have done the same sort of thing. You read the Systematic Theology by Charles Hodge, and you will find he says the same thing, that actually uh, the book of Genesis uh, makes most sense if you interpret it literally, but because science has said there are millions of years, then he says we have to interpret Genesis differently without damaging the text. I put it to you that he did damage the text by his attitude. It's interesting, isn't it, that sometimes e evolutionists can be a little bit more honest than the Christians who, who follow them. For example, the National Geographic magazine in November 2004 said this about the fossil record. Illuminating but spotty, the fossil record is like a film of evolution from which 999 out of every thousand frames have been lost. That would be a really good film, wouldn't it? Here's another comment from a theist, uh, another comment here, that to account for evolutionary changes that take millions of years to completion solely by reference to processes that can be studied only over tens of years requires an, what's that word? Extraordinary faith. 
If you believe the fossil record to be the theory of evolution, then there's 999 frames out of 1,000 missing. It requires an extraordinary faith, which means then that this debate is not actually the way that theistic evolutionists like to portray it as arguing between the fact of evolution and the idea of the Christian faith. It's actually a, rather a debate between a fact-based Christian faith versus an extraordinary evolutionist faith. That's the sort of argument that we are really having. And that's what the theistic evolutionists, those who claim that they want to believe Genesis and believe in the theory of evolution, that's the issue that they need to grab hold of. But you see, their view undermines the very gospel itself. For example, in Romans 5 verse 12, we read that as through one man sin entered the world and death through sin, thus death spread to all men because all sinned. Do you notice there that this verse is telling us that there was a real Adam, a real person who actually sinned, he disobeyed God and brought sin into the world. We read a bit further on in Romans 5, if by one man's offense death reigns through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. Do you see there that the gospel actually depends on a belief in a literal genesis? It isn't good enough to say, don't worry about Genesis, we simply need to believe in Jesus. That is simply not good enough, because the gospel itself depends on a belief in a literal Genesis. There's a logic here, and this is a perfectly logical statement, that one sinful man's life brought death into the world, and therefore one sinless man's death brought life. That's the contrast that we have. People have said to me, well, when Adam sinned, he simply brought spiritual death into the world. Not physical death, because there'd been millions of years of death and disease and destruction before Adam. So he simply brought spiritual death into the world. In which case, if the New Testament equates Jesus with Adam in this parallel sense, I ask you, in that case, if Adam only brought spiritual death into the world, then why did Jesus have to die a real death on a real cross? You see, I don't believe that, the, that, that what Adam did was simply symbolic. As Richard Dawkins put it, too many Christians seem to believe in a symbolic death by a non-existent individual. He's actually got a point, because many Christians do seem to believe that, but I don't. I believe that Adam was a real person who committed a real sin in a real garden. He broke a real command that God had given him. Therefore, I need a real savior to die a real death on a real cross to take away my very real sin. If God used evolution, though, was there really ever a time when there was only one man in the world? Now, many theistic evolutionists would say, well, no, Adam is symbolic. However, there are many theistic evolutionists today who actually say, yes, there was a real Adam. There has been a book going around in the UK. I don't know whether you've seen it over here. It's called Creation or Evolution, Do We Have to Choose? And it's by a man called Dennis Alexander. He is a lecturer at Cambridge University in the biology department. He is also, in his private life, an elder of one of the largest conservative evangelical churches in the United Kingdom. His book maintains that people like me, who go around telling people that Genesis is literally true, are an embarrassment to the gospel. That's the exact words that he uses. An embarrassment to the gospel. Sorry if I'm embarrassing you this evening, but I'm not ashamed of the gospel. But he maintains that there was once a man called Adam. And he maintains that this man called Adam was the first evolved ape. That God somehow breathed into this man, Adam, and he became a living being. He was an ape man before, and then he became a human being. Which makes you wonder then, what's the symbolism of Eve? Did Adam have to look round and see an ape woman and say, she'll do? It doesn't make sense. And it is still undermining the gospel because we have millions of years of death, disease and destruction before Adam sinned. In which case, as I said, it undermines what Jesus did on the cross. So physical death, physical death, not just spiritual death, was actually a moral penalty for sin. 
Remember, God gave Adam a commandment. Only one. We've got ten commandments today. But Adam had just one commandment. Don't eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And God gave him that commandment and he told him what the consequences would be. The consequences were that on the day that you eat it, you will surely die. Death will take over. So a physical death is a consequence. God told Adam that sin would bring death. Adam sinned, and therefore Adam was put out of the presence of the tree of life so that he, would, he could not live forever. Therefore, death was an inevitable consequence. He had to die physically because of his sin. That was what God had told him would happen. That is what did happen because, here's a surprise for you, God keeps his promises. It's amazing to me that the book I mentioned before, Dennis Alexander's book, Creation or Evolution, Do We Have to Choose, has got a huge, about three or four pages of endorsements in the front. And it reads like a who's who of British evangelicalism, shamefully enough. It's got names in it, famous uh, evangelical names like Julian Hardiman, like John Stott, like J.I. Packer. These are people who have endorsed this book, endorsed a book that says that Adam was merely an evolved ape who merely suffered spiritual death. God warned that sin would bring death. And the New Testament also tells us that the wages of sin is death. So there is a complete harmony between what the Old Testament says and what the New Testament says. The biblical teaching on death is that death was not originally a biological necessity. Death wasn't part of the completed creation because the creation was good. Death is not good, which is why we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that death is the final enemy, that Jesus came to undo the power of death. Death, where is thy sting? Grave, where is thy victory? So that's the theistic evolution. It does not fit with the words of Jesus. It does not fit with the gospel. It actually undermines the gospel. It's always about. 